Hi everybody, good evening. I hope uh, you're all having a, uh, a good week. And uh, once again, we are doing our share uh, remotely. Uh, Rabbi Poston has uh, done me the kindness of coming to uh, Or Sameach and B'ezret Hashem. Uh, we hope that we will be able to resume a live in-person share uh, very, very soon as uh, Klal Yisrael and the world hopefully will, will achieve a refuah and uh, the ability to uh, vanquish the magefa, the plague that all of us are facing. Uh, we are in the home stretch of the counting of the Omer and we've been talking about the counting of the Omer quite a lot and I still have a little more to share with you and that is uh, the source of the mitzvah of counting the days between Pesach and Shavuos is a pasuk that we read in the Torah two weeks ago in Parshas Emor Usvartem lachem mi macharas ha-shabbos You start counting literally this means the day after Shabbos we'll come back to that miyom haviyachem es omer ha from the day that you bring the omer offering, the barley offering Sheva Shabbosos Tamimos Tiyana for seven complete weeks and after seven complete weeks you bring sacrifices to God and that of course is the holiday of Shavuos. Now the Gemara records, the Mishnah records, a huge machlokas between our Chachamim that are called the Prushim, the Pharisees. Again in the Christian Bible the Pharisees are the bad guys but the Pharisees are in fact our sages the repositories of the oral law. And there was a huge machlokas between the Purushim, Chazal, and the Tztukim, the Sadducees, regarding how to interpret the verse, Mimacharat HaShabbat. And that is, the Sadducees took the Pasa quite literally. They said Shabbos nine out of ten times, 99 out of a hundred times. Shabbos means Saturday. Mimacharas HaShabbos is Sunday. The Stukim took the position that the counting of the Omer is the first Sunday after the start of Pesach. So even if Pesach was on a Tuesday, you would not start counting the Omer Tuesday night or Wednesday. You would start on a Sunday because Shabbos in that Pasuk is Shabbos Bereshis. And this is consistent with the position of the Sadducees that we always interpret the Torah in a literal way and we don't accept rabbinic interpretations even if it is a halacha l'moshem Sinai. But the Prushim, our sages, took the position that Shabbos in this verse does not mean the Shabbos of Saturday, but Shabbos refers to the first day of Pesach, which is also a Yom Tov, and a Yom Tov can also be called Shabbos because to some degree you must refrain from doing work and therefore Mimacharas HaShabbos is the day after the first day of Pesach ergo according to Chazal according to the Halacha Svira Saomer starts on the second day of Pesach and the Gemara indicates that this was a machlokas that went on for hundreds of years and the Chachamim gave various proofs and analogies the Stukim had counter arguments by the way just as a little bit of a historical digression uh, do not confuse the Tzedukim with a later movement that's actually very similar called the Karaim or the Karaites. They are actually two different movements, although they share a very common philosophy. The Tzedukim were a movement that lived and flourished during the final decades of the Second Temple. And the only reason they were called Tzedukim is because their founder was a person whose name was Sadok. And the Tztukim were people who did deny the oral law. Many of them were very wealthy, politically well connected. In fact, many of them were Hellenists. So in fact, there was a strong correlation that people became Tztukim not because of a religious philosophy per se, but it was kind of a convenient way of getting out of rabbinic legislation uh, for political and social aims. The Stukim as a movement died out 
around the Chorban Bayit Sheni, around the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70. So we do not hear of an organized movement of Tzedukim after the Chorban Beis Hamikdash. By contrast, the Karaites that are still around today, albeit in small numbers, the Karaites date from around the 11th century, uh, which is already after the Babylonian Talmud. It was in the time of the Gaonim. Uh, in fact, the founder of the Kara Karaite movement was a man, Anan ben David, who originally was in fact a regular rabbinic scholar. And when Rav Sadia Gaon got the prestigious position of the Gaon of Surah that Anan ben David wanted to have, out of his jealousy and anger, he started his own movement. So we quite literally know that the historical origin of the Kararites was simply because a guy didn't get the job that he wanted to get. Be it as it may, uh, Karaim and Stukim are not the same movement. They are not descended from one another, but they do have a common philosophy that they did not accept the Masorah, the tradition of the oral law, and the Kararites as well. They will start counting the Omer. If you look at their website, they have websites. So they start counting the Omer the Sunday following Pesach. So whether it's the Tztukim, whether it's the Karayim, we have this huge machlokas. The Karayim and the Tztukim say that Shabbos in this Pasuk means Saturday. And Mimacharas HaShabbos is therefore Sunday. We, however, take the position that Shabbos does not refer to Saturday. Shabbos refers to the first day of Pesach, and Mimacharas HaShabbat is the second day of Pesach. So the question becomes very, very simple. We accept, of course, the validity of the Torah Shabbal Peh, but the question becomes, why does the Torah use a term that is so fraught with ambiguity and confusion? Why does it use the word Shabbos? Let the Torah clarify what date that it's talking about. Now, the Eben Ezra has an interesting observation. Let's consider the alternative. So let's say you don't want to say me macharas a Shabbos because of the possibility that you might confuse it with the position of the Tztukim. What could it have said? So the most likely candidate might be me macharas a Pesach. You shall count from the day following Pesach. But the Eben Ezra points out that would be not satisfactory. And this is an important point to keep in mind. The term Pesach in the Torah never refers to the holiday of the 15th of Nisan. The term Pesach in the Torah refers to Erev Pesach, the 14th of Nisan, when we bring the Korban Pesach even though we don't eat it until that night. So if it would have said Mi Macharasa Pesach, I would have made a mistake. I would have said Pesach refers to the 14th. Mi Macharasa Pesach is the 15th. And you start counting the Omer the first day of Pesach. Therefore, the Eben Ezra says, the Torah emphasizes, it has to be the day after a day that you're Shobes, a day that you refrain from Malacha, which is the 15th. And that's why it has to be Macharasa Shabbos. Because the, the Lushen of the Torah, the Torah describes the 15th of, Pe of Nisan, not as Pesach, like we do. It describes it as Chag Hamatzos. But the truth of the matter is, the Ebenezer's answer is not a complete answer. Because if it's true that Mimacharas Pesach would have given you the wrong day, Mimacharas Shabbos can also give you the wrong day, because it is susceptible to the misinterpretation of the Tzedukah. So what could the Torah have said? Well, the Torah could have said either Usvartem lachem mimacharas chak hamatzot That would have uh, been accurate. Or even better, it could have given me a calendar date. It could have said Usvartem lachem biyom shisha asar lachodesh harishon You shall begin counting the Sviras HaOmer from the 16th of Nisan, or the 16th day of the first month, which is the month of Nisan. So ultimately, we're back to square one. Why does the Torah take the unusual step of referring to the first day of Pesach as Shabbos? So 
So here I want to share with you a beautiful thought from the Meshech Chachma, the Or Sameach. In fact, his picture is right uh, in back of me. The great Or Sameach, uh, his Sefer on Chumash, is called Meshech Chachma. He was Nifter in the 1920s. And he offers the following explanation. If we look at halachic ideas, we find there are two basic halachic distinctions between Shabbos and Yom Tif. Both days are sacred, both days are holy, both days have malacha restrictions that you're not allowed to do certain categories of work. But there are two fundamental differences between Shabbos and Yom Tif. <coughs> Difference number one is on Shabbos, malacha is categorically forbidden unless it's a matter of life and death. If it's not bikuach nefesh, I am not allowed to do malacha on Shabbos. Yom Tif, on the other hand, has a huge leniency. Yes, the starting point is you're not allowed to do malacha on Yom Tif, but there is a heter, a dispensation, that is called ochel nefesh for food preparation and indeed this has been enlarged not only for food preparation but for any type of legitimate need that enhances your Yom Tif celebration you're allowed to cook you're allowed to carry you're allowed to do many many different activities that would normally be forbidden because there is a heter that is called Ochel Nefesh now it's a little complicated because it wouldn't be true to say that everything is mutter for ochel nefesh. So for example, even cooking. You're allowed to cook even raw food and make it edible on Yom Tif, But you have to work from a pre-existing fire. You're not allowed to strike a match. Uh, you're not allowed to turn on your gas oven or turn on your electric burner. Once you have a fire, you can enlarge it. You can even reduce it if necessary for the cooking process. So I'm not going to get into the halachic details of when is there a heter of ochel nefesh and when there is not. But for our purposes, the only thing we have to note is that Yom Tif has such a concept. Shabbos does not. That is difference number one. Difference number two is the source of the holiness. Shabbos is sanctified by God. Even if there would, God forbid, there would not be a single Jew in the world that keeps Shabbos. When the seventh day of creation comes, the holiness of Shabbos comes into the world. Now, it is a little complicated because because of time zones, the holiness of Shabbos hits the world at different times. It's kind of a strange phenomenon. The holiness of God's presence hits the world in Eretz Yisrael seven hours before it hits the world in New York. That's a separate issue. The Kuzari actually discusses the anomaly of God's presence coming into the world at different points based on time zones and the like. But once again, the holiness does not depend on us. Even, for example, a prayer that we recite called Kiddush. Now, Kiddush does mean sanctification. But it does not mean that we are sanctifying Shabbos. We are acknowledging that God made the Shabbos day holy. God blessed the seventh day and God made it holy. By contrast, Yom Tif is a very different situation. The holiness of Yom Tif comes from this Sanhedrin sanctifying the new moon upon the testimony of witnesses and every Yom Tif is X number of days from the designation of a day as Rosh Chodesh the new moon. So if it's Rosh Hashanah that will be the very day of the new moon. If it's Yom Kippur it's 10 days after Tishrei, Rosh Chodesh Tishrei. Sukkot is 15, Pesach is 15 after Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Now the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah in a very famous story makes an important point that even if the Sanhedrin sanctified the wrong day they sanctified the day 
that astronomically was not Rosh Chodesh. The holiness of the holidays is calculated from their designated date rather than the astronomical reality. In fact, the Mishnah has a very famous case where the great Rabbi Yehoshua thought the Sanhedrin had erroneously declared the wrong day Rosh Hashanah. And he felt that Rosh Hashanah was a different day and as a result, his Yom Kippur would be a different day. And Rabbi Gamliel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, ordered him to come on his calculated Yom Kippur day with his money and with his staff. And Rabbi Yeshua didn't know what to do. How could he desecrate Yom Kippur? And Rabbi Akiva told him, the day you think is Yom Kippur is definitionally not Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is not the tenth day from the astronomical new moon, in which case your calculation might very well be correct. It is the tenth day from the designation of the Sanhedrin, where even if they got it wrong, it becomes right. That's an amazing thing. The koach of the sanctification of Yom Tif depends exclusively on the determination of the Sanhedrin. Now you may ask the question, if that's the case, then how could there be Yom Yom Tovim today? Today we don't have a Sanhedrin. Today we're working with a calendar. We just look at when Rosh Chodesh is. But according to what I said, that's not Emes. According to what I said, the holiness of Rosh Chodesh and the holidays is not based on the astronomy. It's based on the actions of Klal Yisrael acting through their Sanhedrin. So how could there be Yamim Tovim today? And the answer is quite surprising. The only reason we have Yamim Tovim today is that the last Sanhedrin, which was uh, several centuries after the Chorban, calculated all of the new moons up until the year 6000. I'll get to why they did that. And they sanctified them. Which means we have Yamim Tovim not because of the Cheshbon, we have Yamim Tovim only because of the sanctification of the Sanhedrin which declared these days sacred in advance. That is the meaning of the statement that you will often encounter, that the Jewish calendar will expire in the year 6000. There will be no Jewish calendar after the year 6000. Now, what does that mean? The calculations of Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we can extrapolate those calculations indefinitely. If you were to ask me, what day will Pesach fall out a million years from now? We would be able to figure that out. So in what sense could it be said that the Jewish calendar expires in the year 6000? The answer is, the calculations don't expire. But the Sanhedrin was Makadesh, the Rosh Chodesh, only until the year 6000 based on the belief that Mashiach for sure is going to come before the year 6000, then we'll go back to the old system of a Sanhedrin taking testimony. Which would mean if counterfactually, it's not going to happen, chas v'shalom, there would be no Mashiach by the year 6000, we would still keep Shabbos. But we would literally have no basis to keep holidays. No Rosh Hashanah, no Yom Kippur, no Sukkot. No Pesach, no Shavuos. Because without a Kiddush based in, there is no holiness. So this is difference number two. Difference number one, Shabbos does not have a heter of Ochel Nefesh. Yom Tif has a heter of Ochel Nefesh. Difference number two, the holiness of Shabbos comes from God. The holiness of Yom Tif comes from B'nai Yisrael acting through their Sanhedrin. This is reflected in the text of the Siddur. The blessing we recite both in Kiddush and in the Amidah of Shabbos is Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed art you God, Mikadesh HaShabbos, who sanctifies Shabbos. On Yom Tif, we have a slightly different bracha. Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed art you Hashem, Mikadesh Yisrael, 
for Hazmanim, you sanctify Israel. And through the sanctification of Israel, there is the sanctification of the Chagim. And that is why it's so consistent. When it's both Shabbos and Yom Tif together, the bracha reads this way, Baruch HaTo Hashem, Mikadesh HaShabbos, V'Yisrael, V'Hazmanim. You don't say, Mikadesh Yisrael, V'Hashabbos, V'Hazmanim. Mikadesh HaShabbos, the holiness of Shabbos comes directly from God. With Yom Tif, it's Yisrael, V'Hazmanim. So these are two, the two halachic differences between Pesach, I'm sorry, between Yom Tif and Shabbos. But then the Meshachach goes on and says, these two halachic differences can actually be explained by a third philosophical difference. That will be the key to understanding the other two. And that is, Shabbos represents a transcendent idea that is not directly connected to the existence of the Jewish people. What is Shabbos? It's a commemoration of the fact that God created the world in six days and he rested on Shabbos. And I rest on Shabbos to commemorate God's creation. Now, as a matter of pure logic, that is not an idea that is limited to a Jew. Non-Jews under the Noahide code are supposed to believe in one God. They're supposed to believe in the Torah's account that God made the world in six days and rested on Shabbos. As a matter of pure logic, Shabbos should be observed by non-Jews as much as it is observed by Jews. There is nothing inherently Jewish about what Shabbos represents. And yet we know that Shabbos is described as a gift that God gave us. Now what is a gift? Something you didn't earn, something you're not entitled to, something that doesn't belong to you, but as an act of unlimited love, it's given to you. Ad Kedekach, that the halacha actually is, that a non-Jew is not only exempt from keeping Shabbos, but a non-Jew is not even supposed to keep Shabbos in all of its particulars. A non-Jew should even, in fact, uh, we're no egg that even a non-Jew that is uh, studying for conversion should do one action on Shabbos. That's an act of Chilul Shabbos. Now, if it's true that Shabbos represents an idea that is not directly connected to the Jewish people, we now understand why we are not the custodians over its holiness. The holiness of Shabbos comes from God because Shabbos has nothing to do with me. Similarly, Shabbos does not bend to my needs. I want to cook, I want to eat. Well, Shabbos transcends me. Shabbos is above me. Shabbos is not going to be governed by me by me as a Jew, because Shabbos represents an idea that transcends the existence of the Jewish people. By contrast, let's consider Yom Tif. Without a Jewish people, there would be no Yom Tif at all. Had the Jews not been taken out of Mitzrayim, there would be no Pesach. Had God not given the Torah to Am Yisrael, there would be no Shavuos. Had God not accepted our tshuva of Yom Kippur and give us back the clouds of glory that surrounded us in the aftermath of our repentance for the Chedo Egel, there wouldn't have been a Sukkot. Yom Tif is a celebration of God's unique relationship with the Jewish people in the absence of which there would be no Yom Tif at all. That is why we are the custodians of its holiness. We are the ones that make it holy through the Sanhedrin. And that is why Yom Tif bends to us. Because since without us, meaning without the Jewish people, there would be no Yom Tif, 
Yom Tif becomes Tafel. Yom Tif becomes subordinate to my Ochel Nefesh. And indeed, the halach is very clear. You're not allowed to cook food for a non-Jew. Yom Tif does not bend for the needs of the non-Jew. Yom Tif bends only for the needs of the Jew. So it turns out, therefore, that this is the structure that we have. There are two halachic differences between Shabbos and Yom Tif. One is Ochel Nefesh and one is Kiddush Beistin. But both of those emanate from a third distinction. That Shabbos is something which we didn't earn, which we're not entitled to, that is not directly connected to us. As opposed to Yom Tif, which is a direct celebration of God's unique relationship with Am Yisrael. So that's kind of the introduction of understanding the structure of Shabbos and Yom Tif. Now, if we take as a definition, therefore, that Shabbos represents that which we didn't earn, which we're not entitled to, something that transcends us, then of all of the Yomim Tovim, Pesach is actually the closest to Shabbos. On one hand, it is a Yom Tif because without the Jewish people there would be no Pesach. But consider this. In Mitzrayim, we were supposed to be slaves in Mitzrayim for 400 years. That is what Hashem told Avraham. But we were taken out 190 years early after 210 years. Because in the course of that 210 years, we had reached what is called the 49th level of impurity. If you hit the 50th level, you're irredeemable. And we had to be taken out not just early, but literally to the minute. In fact, when it says that we didn't have time to let our dough rise, the Arizal explains the small amount of time that it would have taken for dough to become chametzdik, we would have hit the 50th level. And that's the one-fifth that survived. Four-fifths of the Jewish people died in Mitzrayim. They had hit the 50th level. So it turns out, when we were taken out of Mitzrayim, we were unworthy. We were undeserving. We were not ready. It was only God's infinite mercy and the love and the promise that he made to our forefathers that he took us out even though we were undeserving, even though we were unworthy, even though we were not ready, b'chipazan, in a hurried manner. So Pesach is a Shabbos sticker holiday because it also represents something we didn't learn. Unlike Shavuos, where by the time we get the Torah, we've worked on ourselves and we've progressed step by step by step. Unlike Sukkot, where we went through the tshuva and the penitence of Yom Kippur, and we merit the joy of God's presence, Pesach was an undeserved gift that was given to us as divine love. And that is why the Torah refers to Pesach as Shabbos. In fact, I, I might add to the Meshach Chachma that, you know, when the Torah permits Ochel Nefesh on Yom Tif, the Yom Tif where it gives you the Heter of Ochel Nefesh explicitly is Pesach, and we learn the other holidays from Pesach. One might suggest that the Torah has to say it for Pesach because logically, if Ochel Nefesh is because Yom Tif bends to me, because I'm, 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 the, I'm in charge of it, perhaps that would apply less to Pesach, where we didn't deserve that redemption. And therefore the Torah had to say, even Pesach has a heter of Ochel Nefesh, Kal V'chomer, the other holidays. So this is the Meshach Chachma's answer of why Pesach is called Shabbos to reinforce to us that the redemption of Pesach was something that we didn't deserve, we didn't earn. It was given to us as a matnat chinam. I want to take this idea and I want to use it to 
to answer another question that's very perplexing. And that is, okay, let's, let's accept what the Chachamim say, what the Halacha is, that you start counting the Omer the second day of Pesach. But here's the question. Why don't you start counting the Omer the first day of Pesach? Because we t we've already spoken, I think, more than once, that the whole concept of the Omer is to link the holiday of freedom with the holiday of Torah and make it one big Yom Tif. The Ramban, in fact, says that Sfiras Omer is like a Cholomoed because freedom without Torah is the freedom of the wild animal. Remember, that's why the Korban of the Omer and Pesach is barley, which is animal fodder. And the Korban of Shavuos is wheat, which is human food. Because a Pesach without a Shavuos, you're simply a wild animal. And I've mentioned Tagari's beautiful metaphor of the violin string, that only the string that is tied down can give its beautiful music. So all of that is good. You want to link Pesach to Shavuos. But if you want to link Pesach to Shavuos, then start counting day one. Why wait to day two? Why me macharas HaShavuos? So here, let me share with you a thought from Rav Nachman of Breslov who actually brings this from his great-grandfather, who was none other than the Baal Shem Tov. Rav Nachman of Breslov was a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov raises the following interesting question that I think may resonate with a lot of people. When a person first comes to Torah, a person becomes a Baal Shuvah, a person is a Choser B'Tshuvah, they often find an extraordinary sweetness and excitement in their divine service. Every Shabbos is beautiful, every davening is wonderful. Benching, where I get to praise God, is so fulfilling and meaningful. But then what happens as time passes, as you get used to the routine, a person often loses the passion, loses the excitement, acts mechanically out of rote. In fact, there's all sorts of bad jokes which happen to be true, unfortunately. Like, how do you know when a choser b'tshuva is fully integrated into the religious community? The answer is when he can bench in one minute, when he talks during davening, when he spends Shabbos afternoon sleeping instead of learning, Baruch Hashem, he's made it. Again, those things are said in jest, but uh, it's a jest that is a certain biting truth. That is, if you see somebody who's so very passionate about his Yiddishkeit, he must be a newcomer. But the Baal Shem Tov asked the question, why should that be so? I know you're going to say, well, like anything in life, you do it over and over and over again, it becomes a habit, and it's less inspiring. But that shouldn't work for mitzvahs, because if we really believe every time I do a mitzvah, I am closer to God, then how can there be a concept of diminishing spiritual returns? How could it be that the more I do, the less I get out of it? You, again, you could understand that logically in many areas of life. But in the spiritual avodah of mitzvahs, how can it be that more is less? And here's what the Baal Shem Tov says. Because the Baal Shem Tov is addressing the idea that people often have tremendous yurida, tremendous declines, after they've experienced great, great elevations. And he says, imagine a baby learning how to walk and initially the parents are holding the baby under his arms or on his shoulders. And the baby totters forward and takes one step and another step. And things are going good and the kid is laughing and smiling. And at some point in the process the parents feel 
that the child is ready. So they let go. And as soon as they let go, the baby is going to plop down on the floor. Now, of course, what's going to happen is, this is really a talk for another time, but I'm going to mention it, is the baby will pick himself up again. And it's a law of nature that no matter how many times a baby falls learning to walk, he will get up again. The Bredichever said that that's one of the most powerful lessons we should learn from a child. The child never gives up. Somehow as we get older, you know, we're not successful so we don't pursue things. That child is hardwired not to give up. In fact, it's not only walking, even crawling. I remember when my son began crawling, you know, at six months or whenever the kids begin crawling, and crawling was so hard. He was like grunting and groaning, oh, oh, oh. And I was thinking to myself, why is he torturing himself to crawl on the floor? Let him just sit still and play. What is pushing him? The answer is, God put into our personalities the, 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 the unquenchable desire to keep on going, to grow, to accomplish. And it's a magnificent thing that you see from the very beginning of life that is there. That's a beautiful thought. That's not my subject tonight. I'm not going to uh, be marach on this, but that's something to think about. But the, the, the issue that the Baal Shem Tov is talking about is if the baby could verbalize his thoughts after his parents let go of his shoulders, the baby might wonder, why was it so easy to walk a minute ago and now I'm falling? I'm only 18 months. Am I regressing? But the answer is, it was so easy for you to walk because your parents were holding on to you. Now, you have to make it your own. Says the Baal Shem Tov, when a person first comes to Hashem's Torah, they are so far from God. And it's impossible. How will they connect to God? So God carries them. He lifts them up. He gives them an artificial high. And when you have that artificial high, everything is beautiful, everything is vivid, everything is effortless. Everything is so meaningful and spiritual and beautiful. But at some point, God says, I've shown you what you're able to be. I've shown you what you can become. Now it's your job to make it your own by your work and your effort and your struggle. And that's going to be hard. It's not going to be so effortless. And just like Abba and Ima, even after they let go of the baby, they're always there to be sure that the baby doesn't fall and hurt himself. Hashem is always there. But part of growing up spiritually is you have to take what Hashem has given you and make it your madrega. This is, and therefore the Baal Shem Tov says, somewhat counterintuitively, that if a person has struggles in their avoda Hashem, instead of those struggles being a source of despair, instead of feeling that I'm a failure, I'm slipping, maybe it's God's way of telling you, I have confidence in you. I'm able to let go a little bit because you're ready for the next step. And therefore, one should actually take the struggles as Hashem's vote of confidence that you're ready to go on. This may be the relationship of Pesach and Shavuos, which is linked, which are linked by the counting of the Omer. Pesach is the gift that God gave us that we didn't earn, that we weren't ready for, that was not really part of our being. He lifted us up. He showed us amazing revelations of divinity, the ten plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea. Chazal say, the lowly maidservant saw on the Yamsuf 
what even the great Navi Yecheskel did not see in the divine chariot. And that's why the Geula of Pesach is described as Kefitza Vedila, jumping and skipping. It says in Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, Kol Daidi Hinei Zeba, the voice of my beloved, he is coming. Midaleg Alaharim, he is skipping over the mountains. Mikapetz alagvaos, he is jumping over the hills. And the Medrash says, mountains refers to the Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And the hills refer to the matriarchs, Sara, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, Bila, and Zilpa. And God skipping means God skipped over the allotted time. We should have been there 400 years. He skipped over those years in the merit of the Avos and the Imos. But you have to understand the concept of skipping over does not just mean he skipped over the years, but he also skipped over the levels. We did not achieve the spiritual level that we were able to perceive God as we did in Mitzrayim. It's as if uh, the general of the army took a private and he made him a four-star general, or the president. But the private was not prepared. It was not a sustainable madrega. Pesach, God showed you what you're capable to become. But what then happens? He puts you down on the ground. And he says, I've shown you what you're able to become. Now it's your job to become it. Now unlike Pesach, which is sudden revelation, Shavuos is an incremental gradual process. 49 days, la'at, la'at. Meaning, we were on the very top of the mountain, Hashem then puts us down and says, climb it gradually. There are 49 days, it is brought down, Pirkei Avos, the sixth parak of Pirkei Avos talks about 48 ways to acquire the Torah. Different midot that we work on. And it says that every day of Sphira, one works on a particular midah. And on the 49th day, which is Erev Shavuos, you review the 48 ways. Or Kabbalistically, the weeks of the Omer are connected to the different Sphiros. Chesed, loving kindness, Gevur, because there are seven lower Svirot and uh, seven days in the week. And there are even guides that kind of tell you how to correlate your spiritual work with the Kabbalistic manifestations of God's presence through the Sviros. But whichever way you describe it, whether you describe it through the prism of the 48 paths of wisdom in Perkei Avos, or you describe it Kabbalistically through the lower seven Sfirot. The common denominator is the Aveda of Svira is incremental. It is gradual. It is step by step as opposed to the suddenness of Pesach. Pesach is God is holding you up. Svira and Shavuos is I work to internalize God's gifts and make it my own. And that is the connection between Pesach and Shavuos, is the connection of the baby that is walking because his parents are holding it versus the baby that learns to walk on his own. In this connection, the Balatanya quotes another verse in Shira Shirim. Shira Shirim is of course written as a romantic love poetry and in fact, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that that is why there was some controversy whether it should even be included in the biblical canon. But Rabbi Akiva got it in. Rabbi Akiva said, if all of the songs of the Bible are holy, Shira Shirim is Kodesh Kedoshim, the holiest of holies, because the passionate lover is none other than God 
and the beloved woman is none other than the Jewish people. And in the beginning of Shira Shirim, the woman lover, the beloved woman, pleads with her lover and she says, Moshcheni acharecha, pull me after you, narutsa, so we can run together. The Balatanya, I believe, brings from the Zohar. Pull me after you is Pesach. Because Pesach, God is dragging us. We're not really ready. We're not really there. We're not capable. But God is pulling us like a sack of potatoes. Narutza is Shavuos. Where we internalize our Aveda and we run with the Almighty. We run together. We start off being passive recipients of God's grace. And we end with being partners in bringing divinity and holiness into the world by internalizing all of the gifts that God has given us. You know, in life, it is sometimes the case that God gives you, gives us, great, beautiful inspirations, experiences that come into the world that are so uplifting, that are so sweet, that are so beautiful. And they are gifts of God that we savor and we appreciate. But then comes the mundane details of everyday life in which we don't always have the enthusiasm. We don't always have the inspirational encounters that move us. Life seems to be in grays rather than in multicolor. But we have to realize that that is part and parcel of our spiritual growth. We take the gifts that God has given us and we turn them into the gifts that we give God by our work, by our effort, by our struggle, by our incremental sense that even when we're not so inspired, we stay the course. Because eventually we will get to a good and deep place. And this explains finally why Svira Saomer has to begin the day after Shabbos. Because Shabbos and first day of Pesach, as we explained before, is this tremendous gift that God gives you. The inspiration that you didn't earn, that you just receive as a matnat chinam. But Svira Saomer is the tomorrow, the next step, the next place to go, the place where you take that inspiration and you use it as part of your Avedah Sashem. And that's why it's the next day because it represents a new type of journey not the journey of God carrying you, but the journey of your carrying God within the innermost recesses of your soul. And Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, as we conclude the period of the Omer, as we approach the receiving of God's Torah, may we be Zoha to take all of the gifts that God has given us and turn them into the gifts that we give back to God by the way we live our lives, by the way we grow, by the way we care, and by the way we share. Be'ezrat Hashem, we should all a, a wonderful, wonderful week. And Be'ezrat Hashem, we should be together in person very, very soon. Thank you.